I'm reading from uh, Acts chapter 8. I think I'll pick it up with verse 25 uh, to the end of the chapter. What has happened in in Acts chapter 8 is that the early church is experiencing trouble from a guy named Saul, and uh, he really takes over the history of the church pretty quickly. But um, the Lord kind of deals with Saul and gives us a little parenthetical view on the church expanding into a place called Samaria. It was uh, about 12, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem, and it was people who believed partly Jewish, partly maybe a little bit of their Assyrian backgrounds, and it was not considered legitimate Judaism, and they didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like them, and yet uh, Jesus loved them, we see that, and yet God sent an evangelist named Philip to minister to them, and he had a lot of success. Samaritans were becoming Christians, and he didn't know what to do. And he called Peter and John, or the church in Jerusalem heard about it, and they sent Peter and John down, and they, they, they helped establish a church in Samaria. And uh, we're picking up with verse 25. So when it says they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, he's talking about uh, Peter and John and Philip. It says, when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem from Samaria, and they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, this is a desert road. So Philip got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join his chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture, which the Ethiopian was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And the eunuch ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through and kept preaching the gospel in all the cities of Caesarea. All the cities until he came to Caesarea. Please pray with me. Gracious, gracious King, we come before you today with uh, uh, just ourselves and holding your word in our hands, and yet with an expectation that you have never failed on any one Sunday ever, that when your word is presented to your people and to any people, your spirit is at work. 
And so this morning, we rejoice in that. We fully expect the presence of your Holy Spirit to craft the words of the preacher, to shape them into things and shapes that can reach the human heart as the preacher cannot, but your spirit can. Take the story of the Bible, the words that we read, to reach every heart in the room, to unlock it, to uh, sneak in, to crack the window open, to get in with the truth of Jesus Christ, that all would meet this magnificent, wonderful Savior, our King Jesus. We ask for nothing less. We don't just pray to you and say these words in a holy place of being inside the church, protected by its walls with a, 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 a confused and suffering city around us. We pray these words as people of this city and of this land and of this country. We pray these uh, words to you, pleading for the Holy Spirit to work in our land, in our city, in this beloved, confused, and troubled city. And we uh, pray and with the audacity of believing that we are actually hardwired by you to be Christians here. You've made us who you have so that we would be your witnesses here in downtown Portland. Now give us the grace to be just that, your people uh, in this land and in this city. We pray for our country with its uh, troubled uh, political system now, the rancor, uh, the fighting, the media wars, all of the things that keep our leaders preoccupied and not uh, doing what they should do to lead and to make laws and to protect this land. Don't let them be distracted. Bring them to serve you uh, and to know you and heal this country. And we pray for our world, Western Europe suffering through its own heat and people dying and the forest fires there, China suffering through a new wave of autocratic domination and rule that uh, largely becomes focused at the other, at those that aren't like what they want them to be, and that includes Christians. We pray for your spirit and your son to save and to intervene. And of course, Ukraine. Dearest God, we've actually gotten used to seeing missiles blowing up apartment buildings. And um, that's not such a, a shame in itself, but we're weary, easily seduced by promises of greater might and power being the answer, and this side will win, and that side will win, and why don't we just do that? And yet, Father, this is the story of the lost and confused kingdom that we live in but are no longer a part of. We ask you to heal, to bless, to help those dear people. Stop Vladimir Putin. Stop the Russian military. Stop the Russian people from being seduced and tricked into a war that takes their sons and their daughters from them, same as it does the Ukrainians. Put an end to it through your ways, in your timing, but we plead with you to do it soon and immediately. Well, we've given you a lot of requests today, so we leave them before your throne and simply praise you and trust you. Hear our prayers, and you will act on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're talking, as I said, oh, we talked about a lot of things there, didn't we? We're talking about baptism today, and the big idea that I want to leave with you is this, that baptism is a public, dramatized testimony of what God has done in the life of the person being baptized. I'm going to develop that out a little bit more because a lot of the time when we get baptized, what we're thinking is that I, I'd say I'm getting baptized, I'm responsible for demonstrating to you, the church, all that I've done and on the decisions I've made and, and, and whatnot. But really what we're doing in baptism is we are dramatizing and showing the world what God has been up to in the life of the church and of the person being baptized. So we're here to worship God and see his incredible hand in this thing called baptism. Well, to work through the story, 
the first thing we see is that Philip is sent to a desert road. It's on its way um, down to Gaza, and that's south of uh, Jerusalem. We know it today as Gaza City, Palestinian-controlled area of uh, the Middle East and, and uh, between Israel, formal Israel and Egypt, and it is troubled. And uh, in this day, it wasn't as troubled. And it was uh, about, I don't know, 40 or, I think 30 or 40 miles south of Jerusalem. Philip gets told to go down there. And he heads right down there. Get up and go. And he gets up and goes. Along the way, he comes upon an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading scripture in a chariot. This is a very important man. He is, um, well, first off, he is a member of the royal court of Ethiopia of a queen named Candace. The Ethiopian monarchy at that time uh, had women, had queens uh, running the show. And he was in charge of all her treasure. Um, and so he was a big wig. His, when I say chariot, it wasn't like Ben-Hur, like he was up there with his thing, got to make it all the way to Ethiopia, you know. He had a, I, I am imagining, and, and they, they, they found these things archaeologically, he was in a pretty nice ride. And he was making his way back uh, south from Jerusalem. It says that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. This indicates that he was Jewish. And he was making a pilgrimage, you could put it, you could say, to Jerusalem to worship. People still do that today. And when they go there, they often purchase the scriptures in Jerusalem, blessed by a rabbi or, or, or whatever. And they, it's, a, it's a big deal to them. And perhaps that's what he had done. Because he pulls over on the side of the road and he's reading the scriptures. He's an Ethiopian eunuch. A eunuch is a person um, in these royal court situations who has um, been usually surgically altered as in terms of his gender, in, not so much his gender, but in terms of his, his body uh, to where, to put it delicately, he can't have children or make children or get uh, sexually involved with anybody. And you might ask yourself, what is up with that? Well, it had to do with protecting uh, the royal family uh, from possibility of children being conceived within the royal family through palace affairs and things, things like that. And um, so it was to create what was a slave class of people to give their lives and their bodies to serving the royal family. I don't understand a lot of it. It's kind of weird uh, to, to really get into that. But the main thing I think that this tells us is that he was so high up and so important in the job that he did that he was way up in government and had access to everybody at the top. So he's a big wig. He pulls over and he's reading the scriptures. An angel had sent Philip and uh, Philip heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit tells Philip to run up to, his, run up to his chariot. And that's the spirit of God. And he does so. And then he says, how could I unless somebody guides me? Now, the reason he heard him reading is because really, it's only about the last hundred years or so in America when, pe when people read quietly to themselves. Um, it, it just wasn't never done. You learn to read out loud, and you read out loud. You don't find, the, you know, Abraham Lincoln didn't, didn't sit alone in his cabin quietly reading to himself Shakespeare and the Bible and the things that he read. He'd read it out loud because that's how we were trained to read, and the concept hadn't really entered that you can sit and read to yourself. So, this gentleman is reading the, the prophet Isaiah, and Philip hears it, and he is reading from Isaiah... Uh, it sounds like 52 to 53, what Mark read for us this morning. One of the key texts of Scripture that prophetically prepares the Jewish people for the fact of a suffering Messiah. I'll say a little bit more about that. But it was unthinkable in ancient philosophical thought, in ancient religions, unthinkable that a leader of a religion and a Messiah would would not only die, that was considered pretty, pretty unthinkable in itself, but to die in such a way and to come from such a common 
uh, common beginning and common start as Jesus. So the Ethiopian's trying to figure it out and says, well, who is this about? Who's the person that this is about? This is the intrigue of the, of the whole chapter of Scripture. He wants to know, is it about Isaiah? Is it about someone else? Because all I know from reading it is it's that somebody who strangely is called the servant of the Lord, and yet he suffers and seems to choose suffering, and he also seems to, it's implied that his suffering somehow is something that, do, that is done for other people that he doesn't deserve. Unthinkable, unthinkable to Judaism. They had discussions and theological debates in ancient Judaism that went on and on and on and are still going on to this day about the concept of how a real Messiah could actually suffer. They even developed the two Messiah theory. There was Meshiach ben Joseph, Joseph who was, uh, uh, that was considered the Messiah who would return and would suffer as Joseph suffered. And Meshiach ben David, the son of David, who would not suffer. Because they, they couldn't live with the idea that the powerful leader, Messiah of Israel, would be defeated and would suffer. And so the Ethiopian is, of course, very, um, very confused about this death. Well, he asks Philip, and Philip jumps right up in the, uh, jumps right up in the ride and begins to teach him about Jesus, starting from that scripture, from Isaiah 53. Opened his mouth. Beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. That doesn't mean he just only talked about that scripture. It means he said, that's a good jumping off point. Let, let's, let's take a look at this. And he preached Jesus to him. It must have just thrown the Ethiopian his, it must have thrown his mind into another place. Because you see, crucifixion. Crucifixion was, was, crucifixion was so physically horrific. It was the, I'm convinced that it is the worst form of execution that human beings have ever devised. It began with the public humiliation and the stripping and the torture and the whipping and the parading through the streets. And it continued on to the being nailed onto a tree or a cross as if you were an advertisement for don't go against the government. And it ended with the, the maudlin and, and, and perverse picture of a man for hours lifting himself up to get each breath that he needed as he slowly suffocated to death. Crucifixion was um, a public statement that went on sometimes for days, usually not for days, but it went on to show the people at the crossroads of the Roman cities or the Roman uh, streets where they would perform these crucifixions. Here's what happens to people who go against Rome. And it was a process that stripped a person of their psychological, of their sanity. It stripped them of their social uh, well-being or sense of, sense of personality in front of their community. Uh, stripped them of their uh, health and, and their life, of course, through putting them through an extended many-hour process of going into shock, ending with suffocation. And you think water torture is bad, as horrible as it is this is like that, only made to be done in front of the world. It was worse for the Jews in terms of their perspective of it. We just see it from a humanitarian standpoint. Whether you're a Christian or not, you can see that we're describing a part of our faith that might be like, like the person you leave in the closet and kind of keep out because it is so terrible. Nicer to have just a cross without Jesus on it. <laughs> Not nicer to maybe have a crucifix with Jesus already gone and already dead or something. But to think of the spectacle of it is, is terrible to bring before the mind. But it's worse if you're a Jew. Because the Jews had a scripture that said, cursed is anyone who hangs on a cross. Now, if you tool that out and look at the language of it and how it's written, they aren't just saying because he was hung on a cross, therefore we account him cursed. No, here's what it means to them. 
He hung on a cross as public testimony that he was always cursed by God. It just finally caught up to him. Why is he being crucified? Because he is cursed of God. You aren't cursed of God because you have the horrible misfortune of finding yourself being crucified by the Romans in in the eyes of the Jew. You're crucified because you are cursed of God. So spiritually, it strips the person of an identity of even having a relationship with God at all. So the Ethiopian, hearing this, is wondering, is this the person? What made him decide he was the person? I see the Holy Spirit at work here. Luke tells us he's at work here. Something happened that hearing that tale and knowing that truth of what had happened, probably within at least a couple of years prior, hearing that convinced the Ethiopian eunuch, I worship this man. He died for my sins. He is the Messiah. And that is what happens today. And that is what happens to every person that will baptize here this morning. Somehow, sometimes despite the preaching of the, of the preacher, but somehow the Holy Spirit is involved and communicates to the heart of the person, yeah, somehow makes sense to me he died like that and that he is the Messiah. Well, Philip explained all of this um, to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, your Bible certainly, most all of them say something like, Philip said, if you believe with your heart, you may. And he answered, and he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That is a, a baptismal formula from the second century after Christ. Okay, um, the, the, the text does not really indicate that that's what the man said. It seems later somebody put that in because that's what they asked everybody when they would baptize them. And the language itself picks right up with, and he ordered the chariot stop. It wouldn't make any sense grammatically if that sentence belonged there. In other words, the eunuch is presumed by Luke to be a believer. And the eunuch himself agrees and demands to be baptized. And it's the eunuch who says, stop the chariot, I see water, what prevents me? And Philip doesn't say, well, now, are you, are you going to find a good church? Um, you know, we're in the process of writing the New Testament. We're going to want you to get that right when it comes out. And, uh, and, you know, we need you to start evangelizing. And there's probably a lot of things in your life that we're going to really hope to see some improvement on in the months and years to come. None of that. He believed in Jesus Christ, so Philip was honored to baptize him. That reminds me of when my daughter, she's not here today, but uh, when Gracie was, I think when she was about four, she believed in Jesus. And she understood that she needed to believe in Jesus to experience this life that she wanted of stepping into Christianity and following Christ. Well, like any other parent, I said, no. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to baptize you. You're four years old. You're, we're going to just wait a while on that. Well, that worked for a couple of years, um, putting her off. And, I, and, and, and then finally, when she was six, she said, Dad, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yeah, honey, I'm, I'm a pastor. And she said, don't you have to baptize me? <laughs> I said, man, you not only are you ready, you've always been ready. You know, yeah, I'm going to baptize you. So there we were out in the, out in the river uh, baptizing her. And she was like the Ethiopian eunuch said, what prevents me from being baptized? Only in her case, it was my dad for some reason, who's a pastor, but not baptizing me. Um, and she basically jumped out of her chariot and I, and I baptized her. So the Ethiopian asked to be baptized. Uh, They went into the water, and he was. And then we find it's just amazing. Philip snatched away by the Holy Spirit. The eunuch does not see him anymore, and Philip makes his way up the 
coast of, of Israel to Caesarea, big Roman city in northern Israel, and that's where he appears to settle in for the rest of his ministry and, 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 and career. Luke presents to us an amazing picture of people making huge decisions for their life and of the Holy Spirit doing astounding things to encourage those decisions. Isn't it funny how just when the, the, the story is kind of seeming normal, like, and then they had lunch and shook hands and, and uh, Philip went his way up north and the, and the, the Ethiopian eunuch said, okay, I'll, I'll email you. We'll, we'll keep in touch and made his way home. You know, you would expect that, but oh no, God is not going to let us off that easy. He goes, no, my Holy Spirit came, snatched him away. The Ethiopian eunuch felt like a fool because suddenly he couldn't see him anymore. He's gone and he went his way to Ethiopia. And I'm just going to leave it there because I have not been told by the Lord how all that looked. But it does lead me to conclude by asking, what about us today? And what are we doing here this morning? Remember the big idea is that baptism is a dramatized testimony of what God has done in the life of the believer. What we're celebrating here today is not a great thing that these people being baptized have done. A great thing has happened to them. And by the merciful grace of God, they have said yes to Jesus Christ. It is all of grace. Nobody convinced them that Jesus is the Lord by showing them charts about evolution and proofs of the Bible and all of that. Those, those just don't go very far. But when you present Jesus Christ to someone, Christ crucified, as horrendous as it is, the Holy Spirit so often reaches into the soul and the heart of a person and they say, of course. I may not believe a lot, but I believe. And Jesus replies, you believe with a, a, a crumb of faith. And guess what, man? You are saved because that's faith in me. So what we're saying in baptism is this. The first thing a person is being baptized is saying that in Jesus' death for my sins, I died with him, and so now my sins are forgiven. That's when we lower a person into the water. Of course, if I lowered somebody into the water and didn't let them out, they would drown, and that would be a pretty real death. It's lowering them into the water, signifying the death of Jesus Christ. And it's not just that Jesus died and he set such a good example for us that we should all become Christians. No, it's that Jesus died and set things up to where all who have faith in his death on their behalf have his death applied to them as if they had died. So when we're baptizing somebody, lowering them into the water, they are saying, as he died, I died with him, and my sins are now forgiven because he died for sin. The second thing that we see happen is that a person is under the water. Um, they lower into the water, signifying death, and they are an under the water. And this is one of the, what I believe to be the beautiful parts of the way that we baptize. But they're under the water, signifying the burial of Jesus Christ. Because Christ was buried, we know he was dead. And in his beautiful gospel, he said, all who have faith in me, all who believe the, the, the story about me, about me dying, about me being buried, about me rising, all who believe in me and trust me for those things to be true of my life are in me as I do it. So when Christ was buried in the grave, when you are lowered into the water, you are testifying to the world, I didn't do it myself, but guess what? I'm a part of it. I'm included. When he died, I died. That's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Note, Paul didn't jump on a cross. 
Paul didn't do anything like that. Paul simply was included in a historical event in God's eyes. And he had the audacity to say that's really all that counts. Well, when a person is baptized and lowered into the water, they are signifying the burial of Jesus Christ. It's important to us to say that because you don't bury living people. He was dead. He did die for sins and he was buried. And the government at the time, one of the most prominent governments that has ever ruled on the face of the earth, put a seal on his grave that was signifying this is, a, this is the, the location of a dead body. Don't mess with it. He's dead. When he died, you died with him. And finally, a person is baptized and, and, and lifted out of the water, which says, as Jesus rose from the grave, I'm still in him. I am in him in his resurrection. Yeah, I'll spend a little time in the grave. Short of the Lord returning, I'm gonna, someday I'll be in a grave. You're, you'll be in a grave too, or in some fashion, your body will no longer be alive. It'll be very short because the Lord will say your voice and raise you from the dead. When you are baptized, you are saying, here's my witness of faith. When I die, yeah, bury me but I will raise because I am in Christ who rose and is alive, uh, alive today. These are what we're saying in baptism. That's the drama, and that's what we're going to do this morning. Please pray with me, and then I'll give you some instructions for what we're going to do here.